Awesome. All right. So uh, before we get started, I thought maybe I would just give a brief introduction of, of our speaker today, um, Karina uh, Kazmutinov. Is that is that good or close? Um, <laughs> and uh, so maybe just a little background um, as a reminder. Um, this this webinar is really coming from an interest that the panel has had a discussion for a few number of years now of, of starting to interact and liaison more with um, efforts going on within the Gulf Research Program, uh, which is housed at the National Academy of Sciences. And particularly, um, this is, I think, well-timed as there was a recent report that came out of the Gulf Research Program um, relating to understanding and predicting the, the Gulf of Mexico loop current. Um, and that's just one of the variety of, of topics that are coming out of out of the program. And so I think it, it's it's perfect for the U.S. CLIVAR um, to focus um, and maybe see where we can get more interested in potential field campaigns related in the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf Coast. Um, we've done a lot of work on both the East and West Coast, so this offers us a nice opportunity. Um, and so let me first just give a little bit of background before uh, about Karina before I just uh, hand it off. So Karina is the program officer um, since I think late last year at the National Academy of Sciences uh, for the Gulf Research Program. Before that, uh, she was an associate program officer as well as a uh, science and technology policy graduate fellow um, at the National Academies as well. Uh, she did her PhD uh, at, the, at Florida State uh, University uh, in geophysical fluid dynamics, uh, working on a variety of topics, um, which I think are very interesting to fluids. Um, and before that, she actually got her uh, bachelor's in applied mathematics from the National University of Science and Technology in, in Moscow. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Karina and look forward to your talk. Thank you, Kevin. Um, just give me a second to do the share. Um, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. I will warn you, like, I don't, see, if there's people gonna be putting something in the chat, I don't see the um, hang, hangouts right now. Yeah, 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 no worries. I think Jenny will, will keep us posted if anything pops up there. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, as Kevin already mentioned, I'm a program officer for the Gulf Research Program, leading our Understanding Gulf Ocean Systems Initiative. Uh, I also mentioned to Kevin and Jenny, but I want to share with everyone, I watched the recordings of your previous webinars, and today's webinar will be slightly different, but I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, I'm here to talk about GRP's initiative focused on improving understanding and predicting the Gulf of Mexico loop current, which we call Understanding Gulf Ocean Systems. And throughout the presentation, I'm going to start referring it to Hugo's. Um, and, uh, but before I talk about UGOS, I will give you a brief overview of the National Academies and the Gulf Research Program. Uh, even though like from Kevin's uh, uh, introduction, it sounds like you're all familiar, but it will be quick. And then I'll talk about the region of the Gulf Research Program's interest in the loop current and the steps we've taken to develop a research program. And then I'll talk about uh, what is now underway um, to help us meet this ambitious goal of better understanding and predicting the loop current system. So, um, yeah, first uh, I will give you a quick overview of the academies and the Gulf Research Program. So the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine is a private nonprofit institution, not a federal government. Often people think we're a government agency, we're not. And uh, it was established by Congress in uh, 1863 to provide advice outside of government and tap into the nation's emerging scientific community. The academies are best known for consensus reports, but we also provide research grants, fellowships, workshops, and other uses of independent experts. Uh, the Gulf Research Program of the National Academies was established in 2013 with 500 million, million in criminal settlement funds entrusted to the National Academies as an endowment to be fully expanded by uh, 2043. Uh, this, um, this criminal settlement came from the um, Deepwater Horizon, uh, after the Deepwater Horizon accident. And the settlement language of the endowment specifies offshore oil safety, environmental protection, and human health 
as three broad topics that the GRP must address. The objectives of the work in these areas include elements of education, research, and monitoring. So why did the Gulf Research Program become interested in the loop current as a top research priority? Um, the loop current, as you all know, uh, is the major physical force in the Gulf of Mexico, has broad uh, implications for a variety of human and natural systems in the Gulf of Mexico and surrounding regions, and better understanding of it could help in a number of ways, including uh, helping oil and gas companies operate more safely, safely improving oil spill trajectory modeling and facilitating more effective response to natural and man-made disasters, providing cr critical information for weather and hurricane forecast forecasting, which we actually did a webinar on it last week and had a really good attendance, uh, and uh, the recording is available online if you're interested. Uh, providing critical, uh, of catalyzing a new wave of research aimed to understanding the Gulf as a whole, from the coastline to the deep, from the physics to the um, phytoplankton, which has implications on Gulf-wide ecology, the Gulf Coast economy, and the coastal communities supported by Gulf resources. Either directly or indirectly, the powerful loop current system affects just about every aspect of oceanography in the Gulf. So when trying um, to better understand the Gulf, it makes sense to start from the loop current. Uh, so we've established the fact that studying the loop current was a good fit for the GRP uh, did a long list of potential societal benefits. But what do we need to know and where do we start? Is it even possible to predict the loop current? What would it take to better understand the complex dynamics? Uh, for how long would you need to focus resources on this feature and what would it cost? Is it even visible for the GRP to make progress? How could we use GRP funds to advance our knowledge of the Gulf of Mexico in a way that others cannot, uh, cannot do? The answer to these questions, uh, we, to answer all of these questions, we uh, provided support for the Committee on Advancing Understanding of Loop Current Dynamics, a National Academy Study Committee comprised of 14 experts to define a research agenda to advance our understanding of the loop current. So uh, the academy study process is based on consensus, meaning all committee members have to agree on the gaps and they have to all agree on the recommendations. Over three face-to-face -face meetings, the committee brought in experts in the areas of observations, modeling, forecasting, and cutting edge technology. The committee heard from experts from federal agencies, such as the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Office of Naval Research, and the Naval Research Lab. In addition, the committee heard from folks from the oil and gas industry, Mexican institutions, and from those with a successful history of transnational collaboration between the US, Mexico, and Cuba. Uh, the committee focused on identifying the gaps in theory, modeling, observations, and technology. And by no surprise, the overlapping main missing element was deep observations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I said, there were a series of meetings and then the committee focused on identifying the gaps in theory, modeling, observations, and technology. And by no surprise, uh, I've talked about the um, deep observations that they came up. Okay, so wrote the report and it was published in January, 2018, and it's available on the Academy's website and you can uh, download the PDF version at no cost cost. Um, so the foundation of the report is based on feedback between understanding and prediction. There are those that who strongly support understanding as a priority and those that strongly support the need to predict as a priority. The committee went for a balanced approach in designing the recommendations. We need to understand the physical processes so the predictions can be improved. As we improve the models and predictions, we can adjust the observational strategy to better understand the physics, and then again, use the new information to improve the predictions, and on and on. It is of utmost importance that the modelers and the observationalists are working closely together to make progress in both areas, in both areas and that the recommendations in the report encourage such as iterative process. 
So from the start of its process, the committee quickly zeroed uh, in on two key questions. Uh, first one, what controls the penetration of the loop current into the Gulf of Mexico and what controls the eddy shading from the parent loop current? Uh, next slide. The final recommendations can be summed up here. The report recommends a campaign that integrates observationalists, modelers, analysts, analysts, and theorists. There are several factors that could feed into the cycle, such as technological advancements, uh, previous uh, existing and ongoing programs, uh, GRP funds, collaborations with international neighbors, and with the public and private entities. The output of the campaign uh, would be new understanding of not only the loop current system, but of the Gulf uh, of Mexico as a whole, increased predictive skill of the loop current system, a wealth of observations to answer new, to, uh, new questions and new observational infrastructure that can be used for far more than just physics. Uh, next slide. So we've talked uh, about the loop current for a while now. But what is the understanding Gulf Ocean systems or UGAS? Uh, as the report was wrapped up and outreach dissemination strategies were getting worked out, discussions kept coming up about the connections between the loop current and other processes uh, and all of other signs that could potentially be tagged on using the new infrastructure. All of that potential strongly suggested there is a very unique opportunity here and that the research initiative ultimately can actually be um, uh, part of uh, the bigger ways and need to be and doesn't need to be limited to just physics of the Gulf. Uh, next slide. So uh, we convened the experts, we conducted the study, we have the report recommendations in hand, uh, and we broadened our focus from the loop current to UGAS. In the next set of slides, I'll tell you about UGAS Standing Committee, uh, what has been funded so far, and partnerships and collaborations that have been developed. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we have a, sol uh, as I mentioned, we have a solid set of recommendations. I believe that there are 30 recommendations that can fill the gaps and get us to the point of understanding and increasing our predictive skill of the loop current. We have nice set of independent projects started and we're developing some uh, game-changing collaborative opportunities. Now we are faced with incorporating the existing work and executing a larger campaign that is cross-disciplinary integrated, collaborative, and international that has the potential to keep running long after the GRP funds are expended. To help navigate this challenge, uh, we appointed a standing committee comprised of a small group of experts in various aspects of oceanography and all of the common denomina uh, denominator of large campaign experience. At the Academy's standing committee is a mechanism for getting efficient and quality advice on a specific topic. The committee members are free uh, from conflict of interest, and since in this case the committee members will be helping us to develop future requests for applications, they are not eligible to apply uh, for any of them. The committee is a three-year commitment, but can be extended and uh, or refocused as needs of the program uh, evolve. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here are the members of our uh, of our committee. Mel Brisco is our fearless leader. He shares with us his extensive exp experience in managing large projects and campaigns, as well as forming successful and lasting collaborations between sectors. Um, you can read more about each member on our website, and I'll have all the links at the end. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so where we are in terms of grants and partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, on December 18th, 2018, we announced the award of uh, $10 million to support eight projects. Six projects covering the observational topics were chosen to get some long-term observations started, and two studies were chosen to inform the development of the larger campaign. Next slide, please. Uh, this image shows HF radar coverage on the US, US coastline. As you can see, the Gulf Coast has some coverage, 
but there is room for more, uh, for more, particularly uh, in the primary areas uh, of interest for the loop current. Three projects were funded that will increase the service current coverage in critical areas in the Gulf of Mexico using high frequency radar. Data from all three of these projects will provide new real-time uh, data for model assimilation and validation uh, to better understand the evolution of the loop current system. Uh, next slide. Uh, in, um, so the first HF radar project funded uh, is Clifford Merz's project from the University of Southern Florida. This project will uh, procure, install, and operate high-frequency radar systems to measure surface currents at three locations in the Straits of Florida region of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, next slide, please. So next we have uh, Stefan Houghton's projects from University of Southern Mississippi. This project will procure, install, and operate high-frequency radar systems to measure surface currents from two offshore platforms at locations in the northeasternmost areas of oil and gas operations in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Stefan works closely uh, with uh, Shell uh, on this project. Uh, next slide, please. Tony Knapp's uh, project from Texas A&M um, in College Station uh, will procure, install, and operate high-frequency radar systems to measure surface currents in two locations in the Yucatan ch Channel region, uh, the inflow region of the Gulf of Mexico. So, and also, um, uh, Tony got additional funds. I, I forgot from whom, but he also will deploy um, HF radar in Cuba. That way, the full um, inflow region will be covered. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is what the HF radar coverage uh, in the Gulf of Mexico will look like soon. Uh, as I mentioned in my document that I shared earlier, uh, one HF radar has been installed in Marathon, uh, but installations of other six HF radars, unfortunately, have been delayed due to COVID-19 travel restrictions. Uh, however, our HF radar data management team is already working closely with uh, modeling team to ensure that the HF radar data is, a, is in the right format and can be used in modeling studies as soon as it comes online. Um, next slide, please. Um, Installate. So the next uh, project, observational project, is the installation of the of an array of pressure and current uh, current meters uh, by Kathleen Donahoe from the University of Rhode Island. Uh, this project deployed a coherent uh, field array of sensors, 24 sensors in deep waters of the central Gulf region to measure currents and pressures in the full water column from areas near the ocean floor uh, to the surface. So they've already, again, as I mentioned, they've already deployed 24 um, spies and they retrieved uh, six months of data. And uh, they also, on their cruise, did 60 deep CTD casts and data is available on the, on the project's website. And I also shared the links in the document that I've shared before, but I can also send all the links to the data later. Uh, next slide, please. So another um, uh, observational project is directed by Robert Weisberg from the University of Southern Florida. And uh, for this project, uh, we are supporting a single point real-time ocean dynamics mooring that uh, measures temperature, salinity, and currents and discrete depths at the shelf break region. Uh, and data is also, mooring is functioning properly and real-time data is also available. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, last but not least, the observational project is um, Amy Bauer's project on uh, autonomous profilers. Uh, so 20 uh, profi uh, profiling floats have been deployed. They're all active right now, and four or more will be deployed in September. Hopefully that won't be delayed by COVID. And currently the floats profile uh, to 2,000 meters every five days and drift at 1,500 meters uh, between profiles. Data is also available. Um, next slide, please. So, um, Another project is the data compilation project. Uh, it was awarded to 
uh, Gulf of Mexico Coastal Ocean Observance System Regional Association. The project director is Barbara, uh, Barbara Kirkpatrick. And in cooperation, um, so the, um, so currently uh, they have uh, published years of data owned by Dipstar, Fugura, and data say, sets of more than 1,227 days of vessel uh, mounted acoustic uh, Doppler current profiler. Uh, and um, these data sets are from periods from 2010 to 2011 and 2014 and 2015. Uh, to date, more than 25 years, uh, approximately 3,000 unique data sets of historical time series print profile data from the deep water Gulf of Mexico have been ingested, formatted to, uh, to meet um, I, I use requirements and made available through Gulf Hub. I don't think I shared that link, but I can later. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, another project is the numerical uh, modeling project awarded to Roy He, and uh, he's working um, to, uh, he, they are performing assessments of existing Gulf of Mexico forecasting systems to test the performance and sensitivity of current, mo uh, current models in resolving both surface and subsurface circulation and to evaluate long range prediction capabilities. And they also already published uh, a paper um, on this uh, particular project, which again, I also shared, uh, but can share again. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the numerical modeling overarching goal is to achieve greater understanding of the physical processes that control circulation in the Gulf of Mexico, specifically the loop current and loop current eddy separation dynamics through advanced data, assimilative modeling and analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, so the outcomes that the numerical modeling team will achieve are new knowledge of Gulf of Mexico circulation dynamics, new evaluations and improvements in ocean forecasting methodology, assembles from multi-model observing system simulation experiments that can be used to provide a reference for observational design criteria, instrument locations, and sampling intervals, intervals for the field campaign. Uh, next slide, please. So um, on January 22nd, 2020, we announced the award of $2 million to support seven projects. And uh, I won't go into details uh, because Yuga's project just started six months ago. Um, but I would say that most of new grants are awarded to do modeling studies and data analysis that includes machine learning. You can find more details on our website. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the Third uh, piece, very important piece of our near-term plans is to involve collaboration and partnerships. As much as um, I hope uh, you'll remember uh, Yuga's initiative uh, from listening and watching this webinar, but I hope uh, the word collaboration is a keeper too. We're serious about bringing resources together to achieve something greater than uh, any one entity can do alone. We're just starting uh, but we are excited about the possibilities. Two collaborations or partnerships are happening as we speak. Uh, and next slide, please. One of them is this BOEM. We are leveraging, uh, we, um, so at the release of the consensus report, BOEM uh, reached out and offered equipment that they have in storage to be made available to our grantees at no co uh, cost other than shipping. So they are now working uh, with our funded grantees and providing great assistance and resource leveraging to these projects through the use of their observational instruments. Next slide, please. And uh, Stones Mooring is a standalone mooring owned by Shell and is located on the northern edge of the Loop Current Active Area at 3,000 meters of water. The GRP is excited to be working with Shell to help convert the mooring into a pilot long-term observatory in hopes that other operators will follow and create a network of mooring, moorings available for scientific use. Uh, as is, the upper thousand meters of currents are returned in real time from Stone's mooring in accordance with federal regulations. Uh, and the GRP is supporting the Fugger designed extension of real-time current measurements from 1,000 meters uh, all the way to the seafloor. Um, um, next slide, please. And data is also data is also already available online. Um, and through 
that shell collaboration, we are also supporting the addition of a passive, uh, passive acoustic array, array on the mooring with the help of JASCA Applied Sciences. The acoustic in instrumentation is supported by GRP to be deployed for one year and data um, was re retrieved every six months. Uh, the purpose of both a proof of concept and exploratory nature and um, we found that this addition to the observatory to access the ambient anthropogenetic and marine uh, mammal sounds at 3,000 meters water depth in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, next slide. So Gulf of Mexico is a perfect site for pro uh, process studies that can be an addition to Hugo's work. Uh, and here on the left, you see the map of all the observations that are currently supported by Yuga's uh, initiative. And um, Golf, Golf, Hub, Golf Hub will provide the long-term series that can be also used for process studies. And also on the right, I uh, listed the models that are used by Yuga's grantees. So uh, yeah, and next slide, please. I think that's all I have for today. Sorry for some um, technological issues. Uh, here are some links that I promised, and I'm happy to answer the questions that you have. Great, thanks, Karina. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll open it since we have a few people that aren't on the panel. Um, maybe we have time for a, a question or so from anybody that's not on the PISMIT panel. Uh, and, if not, we'll ask everybody that's not on the panel to leave. Um, if not, maybe Jenny, we should go into the closed session. Sounds good to me. Okay, so yeah. So that means that anybody um, that isn't on the panel, which I think is only a few, uh, maybe, maybe one person. I'll allow, Jenny, I'll allow you to. Maybe go through and filter out what you need to filter out. Sounds good. Um, okay, so now it's open. Now we have, uh, thankfully, we have an, an, almost a half hour for uh, discussion here. So I'll just open it up um, to panel members. Uh, of any questions you have for Karina? Yeah, I I do. Okay, um, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Karina, for your presentation. Um, so I actually have a couple of questions. One is uh, how the, um, so you have a lot, several observations coming from different platforms and also you have, uh, looks like several, um, so you only mentioned the one specific uh, modeling study, but there are several models that are used to study the Gulf. So how does the interaction between the observationalist and the models work? Well, you know, what is the, the ways that this interaction is carried out? So, um, yeah, we do work very closely with our grantees. We have quarterly um, meetings with them and we also have uh, annual meetings. And we did, there is a pretty good um, partnerships developed among the grantees and um, our modeling group is working closely with the uh, observationalists. Uh, mm -hmm. And I do think it worked really well. You know, this again, even though sometimes people don't wanna do all these quarterly calls and stuff, but I do think it really, really worked well. And also in our, um, annual meetings, we, you know, we, we have a benefit of being in DC and we would invite uh, other, not, I almost called ourselves federal agency myself. We're not a federal agency, but we do invite federal agencies and there have been already some uh, collaborations too that um, agencies here, what our Yugos grantees have been doing and, um, and are interested in work and in supporting additional, uh, additional work. Um, and then my second question, if I may, is that you mentioned the importance of the loop current also for the for the biology. Um, are there which kind of are there measurements that are taken more on the biological side, biogeochemical side, and uh, how um, are you? How is the program developing that component? That's a really good question. That it's not the first time. Uh, 
somebody asked said uh, we are not currently uh, supporting any measurements um, outside of uh, physical measurements, but we are thinking about it and we are, so it's something our funds are really gonna be focused on physics and where we are trying to develop the uh, collaborations and partnerships with um, funding organizations is for them to support uh, biological, um, biological studies, uh, measurements. But it hasn't been easy, but we're working on it. <laughs> um, I, I have a question. Uh, so my question um, relates to predictability of the loop current. So I'm curious for some of the stakeholders that you mentioned, uh, say the uh, say offshore drilling or fisheries industries, what time scales are they interested in having better predictions or what aspects of the loop current are they especially wanting predictive information? So um, another really good question. With, uh, and I have a better answer for oil and gas, uh, but not so much for uh, fisheries. So for oil and gas, they are interested in long-term uh, predictions to the order, I believe, of three months. So they can, uh, because the loop current doesn't affect operations as much, but it does affect the exploration, like the drilling, uh, and um, because it is a very strong current and they have to plan uh, for where the loop current will be. Uh, and it is like, they were asking for three months in advance. And there are also joint industry programs that we've also been working closely with. Hi, Corina, this is Wei. Uh, very nice talk. So my question is that I'm just wondering um, about the observation and the modeling. So uh, do you like first um, allow some observations and with some data available, then come to model adjustment or like assessment, something like that? Or uh, are you like uh, uh, do the modeling and the observation in parallel, you know, to cross? So, yeah, currently um, the, so currently our, our like main model, uh, all the modeling teams, I should say, Currently, they're using historical data. They're not using the data that is like now being collected. But they are, again, like these annual meetings have been really useful. And there are plans to incorporate, for example, Argo data. There are plans to incorporate HF radar data, but it's not available yet. So, uh, but there are certain things that we're doing in parallel, but there are also certain things that they're using historical data. And again, we want to use the modeling outcomes to inform where the uh, observations are needed, uh, because again, it's very expensive and we don't have unlimited funds. I mean, I don't have to explain it, but, and we would like to have to do targeted measurements. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is so, Mike Patterson. If I can just hop in here in terms of um, the atmosphere, um, so we, I think many of the observing systems that you identified really do focus on the ocean side. And I'm curious, um, has, is there discussion about the couple problem and how the atmosphere plays a role in um, the mechanisms that drive the, drive the loop current? And what observational platforms and strategies are there on the atmospheric side? So there are, we are talking about it and I can't really elaborate on uh, the plans yet. It is something that is on our mind. Uh, it is like, I mean, it's just one example, but uh, the mooring uh, at the, of, um, the mooring does, both of the moorings that we're supporting do have atmospheric data, but I do know that it's not enough. And we are talking about coupled models, but again, there's not much I can add at the moment. Yeah, uh, this is Fred. Hi. Um, so uh, uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'll just start with one. Um, I was wondering how you manage the international
Oh, I can hear. The only one um, HF radar installed in Cuba. So I was wondering, you know, did, did you did you fund any investigators from any of these other countries around the Gulf, or did you involve them in any of the decisions on funding, or um, how did you manage the international aspects of your of your program? So I haven't heard part of the question, but I think I got it. Uh, so we can't currently. There was a quick, uh, brief window when we were exploring the possibility of supporting Cuban scientists, but that window has closed. So we cannot currently support Cuban scientists, uh, but we can support Mexican scientists. And pretty much on almost every of Hugo's one at least projects, there are um, co-PIs from Mexican institutions. Uh, we also have on our standing committee, a member from uh, Mexico and we do, we do invite them to our meetings. Uh, but again, there is much more we can do, but we are already supporting them and the conversations are um, happening with uh, Mexican scientists. Yeah, okay. And, and um, so in, in terms of data management, I, I was just wondering if you have, do you have your own data repository that you're supporting or are you using other uh, some sort of is there is there some kind of um, unified data management uh, strategy that you're carrying out? So the uh, at the moment we are working on it. Like at the moment, I can direct you to one uh, place for uh, all the data, but we are work working with the uh, Grid C. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Uh, but I don't remember what the acronym NOM stands for, uh, but they've been supported. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Great. I didn't, I didn't understand. Great C. Mm -hmm. It's supported through a uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, research initiative, GOMRI, uh, and it's housed at Texas and A&M. Uh, but I don't remember what it stands for, but that's where, uh, all the, um, GRP, it's not only physical data but uh, GRP funded research data is. And also another example is the project that we funded under Yugos One, that's data compilation project. You can visit their um, website, it's called Golf, Golf Hub. Not all the data is available yet, but uh, it will be. Do you have an open data sharing policy? Yeah. Uh, what, what's your data sharing policy? So the data, if it's a real-time data, it has to be available uh, as soon as it goes online. But if it's not, it has to be available within six months of collection. And for the, um, again, for the modeling data, it's a little harder, but it's also the same. It's six months after they are done with their work. This is Victoria. Hi. So, um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I think it's um, we've we've really learned a lot. So, I'm, I wanted to come back a little bit to the modeling side. So, I assume that Royang is working in ROMs, and um, but he's um, evaluating other models like HiCom and MIT GCM and so on. So, are you working with those other groups to incorporate the data in? into the data assimilating versions of these other models or um, are there ways that we could facilitate introductions into those groups that might help um, ensure that they're ready and able to take advantage of the new data sets um, for, for the data assimilating model? So it's definitely a better question for Roy He, uh, but I would say that he is not only using ROMs, like they have, uh, he has a pretty large uh, group, and they are using HICOM, MIT, GCM, ROMs, NEMO, and MCs. And, uh, but I do think like what you've offered, uh, the conversations with other modeling groups won't hurt. <laughs> um, but he has a pretty large um, team, uh, and they're working with several models. Do you use the same Thanks. models also for making predictions? So what is used for the predictions? 
part? Yeah, they're using the same models for predictions and they're trying like one of the objectives uh, of the modeling study is to figure out which of the um, models is doing better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think uh, uh, Charlotte before it mentioned like so you said that the time scale like for example for oil and gas is like uh, they like a prediction around three months. But which aspects of the loop current are they mostly interested in? Like the position, the strength, the, um, what do they, do they want to know? So I think there are, and again, don't quote me on it, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, they are mostly interested on the position. Um, but yeah, like we actually did, and if you're interested, I could share results with you. We did do a short survey and mostly um, oil and gas folks uh, responded to it because we reached out to them and it was like very specific and I can share the results with you. We didn't get that many responses, but um, I have the information. So this is Mike again. Um, I'm curious in terms of the upstream region in the Caribbean of the inter America seas um, that is there a focus on that as well um, in terms of mechanisms that control the, the loop current and how that how is that being tackled so yeah another very good question and something we did discuss but uh, nothing we it hasn't been a focus yet but we are in only like we're two years in the program and it's something we are currently in planning phase still for the future work and it's something has been discussed but i cannot comment on it yet in so, detail. so so i bring that up in part because um within clivar internationally um years ago there was a focus on the inter-america seas mm -hmm. and it did um at least set the stage. It kind of drifted off uh, as we transitioned Clivar internationally and stepped away from uh, the kind of variability of the American Monsoons program. And so it was kind of a casualty as things uh, transitioned. And then Gomri came on. And so there was kind of this sense that um, work would continue forward. But I think things might have stalled out there. But um, I can follow up with you, uh, Karina, offline with some mm -hmm. of that material as well where the community has looked at these large-scale controls, um, things like the, the um, Bermuda High, for example, and the importance of the large-scale circulation and the role it plays, as well as the importance of the Gulf and the Caribbean in North American climate on the timescales that you mentioned. Um, and there's been a lot of work by um, uh, University of Miami and mm -hmm. NOAA AML on this topic in particular. Uh, that there's um, additional motivations from the climate side in terms of understanding this region and its influence on things such as springtime, uh, severe storms over the southeast and, and midwest, um, uh, the regulation of the uh, low-level flow, the low-level jets that pump the water through the atmospheric river um, and the seasonality of that. Um, so there are a lot of issues from the climate side that I think our community will be are interested in as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that includes kind of the large scale context of the circulation, both on the in the atmosphere and the ocean, and as well and the impacts and variability in the variability that the the Gulf current or the loop current can play a, a, an important role in. So, be, getting beyond the um, the uh, weather time scale of hurricane, uh, which is also an important um, aspect um, of our the climate. There's climate interest too, as well, in terms of mm -hmm. uh, the seasonality or the upcoming season, hurricane season, and how warm the Gulf will be. So, I think there's um, a lot of fruitful um, interaction potentially down downstream between U.S. Clivar and the efforts that you guys are are, are mounting. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, uh, Patrick Taylor put in a question in the comments that's um, related to the atmosphere and the loop current. He says, this seems like an excellent place to build partnerships with NASA and NOAA. <coughs> Have these partnerships been, con sorry, excuse me. 
Have these partnerships been considered specifically for understanding the role of the atmosphere and the potential leveraging of satellite data? So are the already funded projects using any available satellite data? So, um, yes, we have uh, considered the potential partnerships with NOAA and NASA. Um, I do, again, like, I do think that our modeling group is using um, available satellite data. I mean, they should be, but I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to um, speak for them. Um, and it's something, yeah, it's something we've been discussing, but I don't have um, any examples of already like successful partnership, but obviously we cannot do oceanographic work without NASA and NOAA. So maybe I'll ask a, a question um, kind of related to both of these topics. Uh, and I, so I know that you, you touched on this a little bit in your, in your presentation. Um, and in addition, you know, there was, especially early on, you were talking a little bit about the history of how you, you've gotten to these projects and, and you know, where, where you are going in the future. But maybe I'd be curious if you could talk a little bit more of what maybe the long-term future plan is, right? I mean, is it, is there a goal to maybe just keep funding small projects? Is there an effort to potentially put money towards a larger focused effort uh, based upon what comes out of these type of projects that are ongoing? Um, maybe just a little bit of insight there, if you have any. So I do have some, but I cannot talk about it yet. <laughs> uh, we, it, we're soon gonna um, share some good news, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I think that's that's another you know avenue where uh, I think it'd be great for um, for this continued dialogue to to, to go forward. In part because uh, this panel particularly brings a lot of expertise in um, in kind of best practices and, and learning from previous process studies and field campaigns. Um, we actually have uh, um, some. Some documents. We have a recent paper actually coming out in BAMS um, related to process studies um, and, and good approaches for them, and and we we would love to be involved in the early run of any potential kind of projects that are that are at that scale, mm -hmm. um, and, and and not just be involved. You know, I think it, there you there'd be a lot of help on both sides. We have experience of doing this for for you know, well over a decade, but also you know, it's always opportunities to interact with new groups um, and, and stuff is, uh, an, uh, I think, advantageous for both sides. So and I'll, I'll add to that, um, both in, in terms of the scientists that um, you can engage more broadly through US Clivar in this panel and our other panels, but importantly, a portal to US funding agency managers comprise our interagency group. So um, the physical oceanography, uh, program managers across NSF and NASA at um, NOAA as well, and ONR, all sit at our table, along with those that are working on um, atmospheric um, uh, large-scale um, dynamics, and um, I guess the modeling programs, those climate modeling programs across the agencies as well. So we have this nice um, ability to share um, or, uh, or help uh, with that engagement of this climate um, right and maybe just to add is, is without divulging too much information but I think against the variety of, of um, federal agencies there is a pretty big effort and focus on kind of the climate at the coasts um, between NSF Department of Energy um, and so that's something that the US Clivar uh, is very is very interested in uh, as well and helping to facilitate um, across multiple agencies, which is one of our goals. Mm -hmm. And something I would add that uh, it's definitely important. I mean, I agree, like continuing the dialogue, uh, but it's also, we have the standing committee and we are looking to appoint a couple more additional members. So if you can think of someone, uh, please feel free to share the name. Uh, and. Um, but I, there is a caveat. We cannot appoint any current uh, government employees on our committee. And again, if you're interested in potential funding opportunities that would come up, you also cannot be on the um, on that standing committee. But if you can think of any names, um, 
it's it's always helpful to have more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, all right. If is there any last minute questions? I think. I, I'm it's sorry. I had one last, yeah, go ahead. Last Victoria. minute comment is um, I I was reminded that of the ongoing efforts to plan um, for a potential follow-on of geotraces in the Gulf of Mexico. And I just was hoping that you were um, uh, engaging with that community possibly as well. And, and if not, maybe we could um, help facilitate that communication as well. I think at some point there was, I was not part of the conversation. At some point, I think the GRP did talk to the group, but I do think we it will be useful to re-initiate the conversation. So, yeah. Um, one, one other thing, if I can hop in here um, about the observational efforts um, and the building of the data, data um, historical data records, and making those available. This is something that came up a few years ago. And it's good to see that ONR and NRL are at the table. Um, they, um, the Navy has extensive, um, and uh, I guess, uh, for some time were not available, unavailable for public um, access. Uh, collection of um, observations in the Gulf um, during the Cold, Cold War era, the 80s, mm -hmm. um, up to the 80s, and then there was a significant drop off in terms of the investment. You're probably aware of that. So the art, the data archaeology aspect here, have, have you guys talked about that and the need? to partner with the Navy. I know there's interest that NOAA as well um, with the with their ocean data grams. Um, perhaps do some of that archaeology and get that into their data the energy data set. Um, is that something that's come up in your discussions? It hasn't come up yet, but we have been talking to ONAR and NRL. Uh, so it's something definitely next time uh, we can discuss. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All right. Well, I think that we we actually are, are going to finish right on time. I think maybe a record since we've switched over to the full kind of virtual world of, of having some delays. So thank you, Karina, for your time. We look forward to, to you know, having a continued dialogue going forward. and. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Friday afternoon or morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Karina. Thank you.